प्राण पुरुषा सत साई नाथा प्राण पुरुषा सत साई नाथा स्वरूपा परतीशा स्वरूपा परतीशा स्वरूपा परतीशा अंबा भवानी हे शिव शंभ कुमार सराम एवरी वन वी वेलकम ऋषि अगेन टू आर साई सेंटर हियर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द नॉर्थ वर्क सेंटर थैंक यू सो मच फॉर कमिंग ऋषि फॉर ऑल ऑफ यू हु ज्वाइनिंग न्यू दिस वीक um just some fun facts about rushi um rushi is uh, is a bhajan i would say he's an uh, he is the i would call it the bhajan lal of uh, probably the northeast uh, mid atlantic area he's very passionate about bhajans and he would like to um he composes bhajans he sings well he plays the tabla and he orchestrates and he's also sound engineer and what else rushi am i missing anything <laughs> Rishi is one of the most sought after young adult in the region to kind of come and lead bhajans everywhere and uh, he is uh, you know another fun fact about rushi is like he's been celebrating his birthday he really believes that he is god because he has a global account bhajan called rudbab on his birthday <laughs> so um truly believes that uh, swami resides in him and then he needs to celebrate the birthday with swami there and uh, Rishi also happens to be the um, national young adult leader for uh, the US. He's in the world, I think, right? All deputy international. Yeah, international. So he's not even, um, you know, national now. He's international uh, personality, and uh, it's very exciting that uh, Rishi is here amongst all of us. And without further ado, Rishi, off you go. Saira, <clears throat> Saira, everyone, thank you so much. for this wonderful opportunity to once again uh, discuss this topic that is so dear to my heart today uh, with swami's blessings we have an added bonus my brother uh, my good friend brother uh, krish devan is joining us today um along with you know sai bharadwaj was lovingly arranged for this workshop with the officers of the norwalk center just a little bit about krish he's currently a surgery resident at the robert wood johnson hospital in new brunswick um he is graduated from med school um he is the son of uh, auntie seema dewan who many of you might know uh, pretty well who has written many books on swami so um did i miss anything <laughs> and also uh, i would say that even though i know i don't know you personally but i follow your uh, posts on facebook so he is also an um you know he is uh, he tries to bring out all the best budgets from st years and posts there and he has the most amazing collection of swami's uh, audios videos bhajans from the alumni i think from the beginning of the prashanti bhajan group i would say right am i right yeah actually uh, that's so i have a twin brother uh, karan um it's myself karan and shiva is our younger one and all three of us sort of have this collection of videos and karan is really the spearhead for all of this he's actually working closely with radio side to post all of these so with swami's grace uh, the collection is booming <laughs> yes Welcome to the center. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Swami's grace. So I will uh, just start sharing my screen. So last week we had ended. I mean, sorry, last month we had ended the session talking about quickly just the importance of practice. And for shortage of time, we didn't delve too deep in that. So I'd like to start the session once again by talking about the importance of. practice and the duties of the lead singer so on that note i had ended the session last time talking about why we should practice every bhajan 100 times does anyone remember the breakdown of why we should practice a bhajan 100 times any volunteers to share I know it is right out of my mouth. Why then you would remember the words? So, Bharata, like Bhava Ragatala, so twenty-five, 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 right? Kind of, you're on the right path. 
And then Swami immerses himself after a hundred times because he, he remembers your budget. That's, 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 that's when he does. That's yeah. the end. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the end. So everybody else can get the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> You start feeling the bhajan more, you, you start living the bhajan, I think, by a hundred times. Yes. 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 So just to refresh everyone's memory, very good answers. Thank you for sharing. To Just to refresh everyone's memory, technically speaking, Bhava Raga Tala is covered within the first 50 times of the bhajan. But practicing the bhajan a hundred times is about us becoming one with that bhajan and really resonating with the meaning and the tune uh, and the lyrics and the beat of the bhajan, really making that bhajan a part of you. You know, physically, you should feel that you have become that bhajan when you finally sing it. And of course, you know, we have a huge repertoire of bhajans and it's difficult to practice each bhajan a hundred times, but it's actually quite feasible to do. If you practice singing one bhajan, you know, it takes about three and a half, three minutes, 45 seconds per bhajan on average. So if you were to sing it, you know, 16 times a day for that's one hour, you doing that just for five or six days, you'll finish your, your hundred times of practicing the bhajan. So it's actually quite doable. Um, so to refresh everyone's memory, the first 25 times we practice the bhajan, we get familiar with the musical aspects of the bhajan. The raga and the tala is covered within the first 25 times. From 26 to 50, we get familiar with the bhava, the feeling of the bhajan. Then from 51 to 75, we start losing ourselves in that bhajan. We become one with the bhajan. And then it doesn't end there because you want Swami also to be a key stakeholder in this, right? So from 76 to 100, Swami starts immersing himself in your bhajan. And then in the 101st time, when the bhajan is offered at the center, anyone who is listening, anyone who is singing chorus and clapping loses themselves in the bliss of Swami's presence if that bhajan is done with that right sadhana. So as we see here, the lead singer is the conduit for the entire congregation. And the sadhana that a lead singer must undertake is, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to do it, but it is quite an intense sadhana that all lead singers of bhajans should undertake. Um, for example, I mean, I have uh, not been sleeping really well, and that's affected my voice kind of, as you can hear today. So, you know, sleeping well, hydrating, eating the right kinds of foods, they're all important sadhanas that lead us to being good bhajan singers. And for example, um, so this is slightly on a tangent, but Catholics, when they go for communion at the church, they're not singing or anything, but when they go for communion, they actually fast for three hours before that mass. They don't have food or water so that they mentally and spiritually prepare their bodies to receive Holy Communion. And so if they're able to do such vigorous sadhana for, you know, to please Lord Jesus Christ, can we at least do a little bit of sadhana before going into a bhajan session to physically prepare our bodies to receive those vibrations? Swami says the first form of sadhana is control of the tongue. Of all parts of the body, the tongue is the first most important point of, of control. Because from the tongue, we have control over food. We have control over what we speak. We have control over our breath. Everything is from there. So if we watch what we speak every moment of the day, watch what we eat, how we breathe, even exercise, developing breath control, and with every every step that you take on the treadmill or on the bike, you're thinking so hum, so hum, thinking of Swami's, Swami's um, grace. All of that then reflects in our bhajan and our sadhana. So every every moment of our life should be bhajan. But that doesn't always mean singing bhajan. That means being in bhajan state. So it starts from the tongue. As I had mentioned last time, the human lifespan can accommodate 11.8 million Sai bhajans. It's up to us how many of those chances we really gather and sing for Swami. Um, so as I last time I was mentioning, right, Sai Bhajans is a work of art where silence is the canvas and our voices 
are the colors and the paintbrush. But what is what is behind all of that? What is who, what is the painter? The painter is our breath. It is because of our we were able to breathe first that the vocal cords, the vocal folds in our throat vibrate, and then that manifests as sound as music that comes from our mouth. So I wanted to share some important breathing techniques that we should do as bhajan singers. So typically what I do is, so per Swami's guidance, what the Prashanti Bhajan group does is every morning before Suprabhatam, they do these breathing exercises. Then they do this something called bass practice and we'll go into that as well. So to the human voice is kind of like a slingshot. The further you pull it down in the morning, down in the sense, the further you go low in the morning in terms of the pitch, the higher your voice will actually shoot when you render bhajans and it'll give you that clarity. But before that step, it is important to practice good breathing. Um, of course, I don't wake up at 5 a.m. to do this. For me, typically, it's when I'm driving to work in the morning. Um, since I have an hour-long commute, I utilize that time to do these breathing practices and my base practice in the morning. So the breathe, this is a very simple breathing exercise um, that my vocal teacher, Shrimati Sangamitra Chatterjee, taught me. So basically, we breathe in once, and it could be the length of, I would say, like one Sai Gayatri. Then you breathe in. Then you hold the breath for four counts. One, two, you can say Om, Shri, Sai, Ram in your head. Then let go just a little bit. Then hold again. Om, Shri, Sai, Ram. Then let go everything. And then again, wait for four counts. Om, Shri, Sai, Ram. And then again, repeat the cycle. So you breathe to the length of one Sai Gayatri. And the importance is the process of breathing in should be slower then breathing out. Of course, in this case, we are elongating, sorry, the process of breathing out should be slower than breathing in because breathing in, we're just doing it in one shot, but breathing out, we are staggering it and we're holding our breath. And that kind of breathing exercise of controlling the breath from being released is exactly what our lungs need to become good bhajan singers. So let's practice this breathing exercise. So in your mind, so actually, I'll, I'll chant it out loud for you while I chant one Sai Gayatri, breathe in, and then I'll guide you through the breathing exercise, and we can do it a few times. So as I chant Sai Gayatri, breathe in. Ready? Om Sai Shwaraya Vidmahe Satya Devaya Dhimahe Tanna Sarva Prachodaya At. Hold the breath, Om Shri Sai Ram. Release just a little bit, four counts, Om Shri Sai Ram. Hold, Om. Shri Sai Ram. Release Om Shri Sai Ram. Hold Om Shri Sai Ram. Release all the way. One. Yeah. yeah, we'll do it a few more times. Okay. Breathe in. Yeah, it might be it might be tough. Yeah, without a ma with a mask on. So once again, Om Sai Shwaraya Vidmahe Satya Devaya Dhimahe Tanna Sarva Prajodaya At. Hold, release, hold, release completely. And just straight breath, breathless for four counts. One, two, three, four. Again, breathe in. Om Sai Shwaraya Vidmahe Satya Devaya Dhimahe Tanna Sarva Prajodaya Hold. One, two, three, four. Release. One, two, three, four. Hold. Release completely. One, two. And hold. Om Sai Shwaraya Vidmahe Satya Devaya Dhimahe Tanna Sarva Prachodaya At. Hold. Release. One, two, three. Hold. One, two. Release completely. One, two, three. And hold. One, two. We'll do it one more time. 
ओम साईश्वराय विद्महे सत्य देवाय धीमहि अन्न सर्व प्रचोदयात होल्ड रिलीज वन Hold. Release completely. One. Hold. One. You can breathe normally now. It's a PFP test also. So remember, it's a forced expansory volume. That's right. Take it up and slowly release. Yeah, Krish, you can give some medical light onto how this breathing will help us, how it'll maintain our voices. Actually, yeah. So, yeah. so. You know, everyone has a different lung capacity, as Uncle was saying, the PFTs, uh, but everyone has a certain lung capacity. And you'll notice, you know, for example, people who are athletes or who are instrumentalists, especially wind instrumentalists, will have larger lung capacity. And that comes over time from, from practice. But one thing I wanted to add also is that posture is very important for this practice. Um, a lot of people don't realize that or in, inadvertently will slouch. Um, and, and posture does not also mean that you have to be ultimately erect and, and, and unrelaxed. You have to be relaxed, but in the proper posture. The main importance is that your diaphragm has to have enough room to expand all the way. When we sing bhajans, we sit down and sing bhajans, which is very different from Western music where everyone stands up. It's much easier to get full breath control when you're standing up. But when you're sitting down, it's very difficult because your diaphragm does not have enough room to move. And so building this type of um, this type of control over time is very important. Yeah, that posture is really important. And I've actually, re so I had a, I, after actually I came last month, I went to an ENT because I felt a lot of hoarseness in my voice and I, they did like a Laurent, you know, they put the scope inside and I, they saw that I had like a sinus infection inside. So I took antibiotics and I'm just getting over the effects of that. But through that experience, I've actually realized the posture is so important that when we sing, especially when we sing lower notes, like the tendency is to actually put our heads down and sing the lower notes. But what the, re the proper way to do it is to have your head actually at, at least straight, if not slightly tilted up looking to Swami. So, there's immediate difference that you'll notice. I know it's, it's the natural instinct to look down if you're singing lower notes, but looking up slightly helps for that voice to flow smoother. So posture is very, very important. Yeah, when people look down, the reason is because the tendency is that you bring those lower notes, your vocal cords are not opening as large. But the problem is the opposite, actually. Your vocal cords are not opening enough. And so keeping your head up and focusing internally on opening up your airway and not your mouth, not your head, is very important. Many of you, of course, may have heard of Ravi Kumar Bhaiya and, and uh, Ash, um, Ashwat Kumar Bhaiya. Uh, when they sing, if you notice, their head's always straight and they have minimal facial expressions, like no facial expressions. Their mouth is in almost in the same position the whole time. Everything is from the throat and from the stomach. And so maintaining that sort of in your mind while you're practicing is also very important because the air comes from the throat, not come from the mouth, doesn't come from the head or motion. Another thing about the posture of the lips while singing it's very important to actually, as Krish mentioned, not have too many facial expressions. But the one expression that we should have is to always smile while singing. And you will actually see it makes a difference in how your voice sounds. When we smile, our voices actually sound a lot sweeter. And that is when we say, wow, the Prashanti Bhajan group, their voices sound so sweet and so melodious. That smile, I tell you, is the secret ingredient. So I'll demonstrate if I sing without smiling. Very simple bhajan. I'm going to sing normally without with a very platonic facial expression. Jai Jai Prabhu Gidi Bhari Natavar Nanda Lala Natavar Nanda Lala He Giri Dhar Gopala He Giri Dhar Gopala He Giri Dhar Gopala He Giri Dhar Gopala That same bhajan, I put a smile on my face and sing 
ಜೈ ಜೈ ಪ್ರಭು ಗಿರಿಧಾರಿ ನಟವರ ನಂದಲಾಲ ನಟವರ ನಂದಲಾಲ ಹೇ ಗಿರಿಧರ ಗೋಪಾಲ ಹೇ ಗಿರಿಧರ ಗೋಪಾಲ ಹೇ ಗಿರಿಧರ ಗೋಪಾಲ ಹೇ ಗಿರಿಧರ ಗೋಪಾಲ did you notice a difference in the tone this is the and see this is all a positive feedback loop right when we talk about having bhava in bhajans the main bhava we should have we should have be having joy that we have the opportunity to sing to swami the king of kings right so if we smile and sing not only will it help us maintain that bhava but it will also help us to have a better physically have a better tone in the voice so you know even if you're not happy that day if you, if you have some difficulty going on if you smile even those difficulties will go away as swami had once has has said you know if you tend to be even if you pretend to be happy right if you pretend to be happy you will tend to be happy you will end up being happy so that's the importance of smiling while we sing bhajans and there's actually scientific um data on this believe it or not of how i see bhajans teach us so many life lessons also but for people who have clinical depression just the act of smiling alone even when you're depressed actually reduces uh, produces endorphins and all the molecules that in- increase happiness so just the act of smiling alone through the bhajans helps evoke that bhava for every bhajan it's one of the things also like in a shan who's a very uh, big shan yes. is a very very famous bollywood singer playback singer and he has one of the main lessons he gives to his students is to start smiling and singing he always smiles and sings because he says that when you sing it's a duty of the singer you transmit that smile to the people who listen so through me that's one little seva that i do when i sing i smile and sing i might be going through a difficult time in my life whatever can be happening but people have come here to listen to me in a bollywood in a setting he said but my duty is to share that smile that love with everybody and he insists that everybody smiles and sings and and you you can see whenever shan sings he's always smiling he's a perfect role model if you see all the bollywood singers he's the only one really lead with example with the smiling and singing that's why he's so different than all of the singers you you see it all of the other singers notice is that he's the only one really bring that divine energy to to his songs because he's just smiling all the time so you like you know that's and you to your point sentiment because you know when you smile like depression and the uh, anxiety what happens when you smile the the it dance dopamine release in the body and that helps to bring the mood So there's a scientific uh, article on that too why sm- uh, smiling and really bring that joy to other person you don't know what other person is going through right but that is bring that energy and that's what get through the chemicals the dopamine that helps in the mood as well the two of you are doing that today yeah so you want to smile more so then the question becomes what if we're singing a daya karo bhajan daya karo krupa karo even then we should try to smile because when we come to swami there's one so I'll backtrack a little bit and go on a tangent my grandfather um you know shri mangesh thanawala he was a harmonium player and was a very active member of the shri satya sai seva organization in gujarat and he had the opportunity to sing in swami's presence when swami visited gujarat and you know he went to parthi many times as well and so one time he narrated uh, the story to me where in um he attended uh, swami's 70th birthday celebrations in the hillview stadium um and as swami came in on the silver chariot um as swami was getting up, was on the chariot the students were singing bhajans and one of the bhajans that the students immediately picked up was tere seva prabhu koi nahi hai tujhko mera pranam and swami immediately stopped them from singing that bhajan in the middle of the birthday celebrations swami asked them to stop singing this bhajan and swami then explained to them in that bhajan there is a line dwar khadi ho me dukhiyari sun lo meri pukar 
if you are standing at the doorstep of god regardless of what life situation we're in if we are standing at the door so what that line means for those of you who don't understand hindi dwar khadi hu main dukhi hai meaning i am so depressed and forlorn i am standing at your doorstep oh god please open your doors right if you are standing at the doorstep from god we should not be anything but extremely blissful and elated saying that we are standing at the doorstep of god in a sad sullen mood is in fact an insult to swami's presence so in fact after that incident you will never hear that bhajan being sung in sai kulvandha so of course very very depressive bhajan such as that should should be avoided but even when we sing bhajans like daya karo krupa karo what are we really asking swami for are we really asking for material wealth sure it's nothing wrong to ask swami for material wealth, but what is the true goal where should our minds really be when we are singing bhajans we should be asking for that spiritual wealth that spiritual compassion and so when we ask swami for that we should be happy when you go as a child if you want something from your parents you want to borrow some money from them or you want candy or a game or a toy as when we were children would you go to your parents in a very soft and sullen and sad mood no he's your they're your parents you have the ultimate right to ask them for something so when we go to swami to ask him for something he is our divine mother and father it is our birth right in fact we are our we, sh- we he is the only one who we have the right to ask him for anything and so when we even we sing daya karo kripa karo bhajans we should sing them with the pride that swami is our mother and father and so even those bhajans yes i mean we'll go into the whole musical aspects behind those bhajans as well but we should sing them with the feeling that i have the right to ask from god because he is my mother my father my best friend whatever you consider swami to be in your life so then how do we we went over the breathing techniques the next step is to as i mentioned preparing the voice to sing bhajans yes yes so so as you were saying about smiling and and singing so sometimes you know like you are so engrossed in the bhajan that you know like you get so emotional you get there's so much of connection that the tears flow uh, at that point of time and uh, I still remember. I, I'm digressing here. I don't want to take. No, please, please go ahead. You know, like yeah. we were at uh, Puttaparthi in 2007, and Swami gave uh, uh, all the performers, you know, saris, and I still have the picture where I, I'm getting the sari from him, and I'm crying, and my face is so like it's it's not the smiley face, and I regret it. You know, like I had that great opportunity to just. to see him right there and and smile but i couldn't how i mean how do you how do you help with that see these are all these are practices right so when we have for example we're doing aarti or we're doing different components of of our puja these in itself they are just practices they are not the ultimate goal they are methods of helping us getting there so there's different steps in this journey through bhakti to get to swami from bhakti to mukti and this step this process of making sure you have a smile on your face is the first step this step is for you to remind yourself in the same way that we have pictures of swami or statues of swami to remind us that this is our focus then the next step is that you internalize that that instead of having on your face all, your whole body is in happiness and complete bliss in swami and the final step is that you and swami are completely merged there's no difference whatsoever there is no people around you there is no feeling of bhava there's no bhajan that's being sung there's just you and swami together so rather than the focus being on the smile the focus should be on obtaining that oneness with swami and so if that's the next step then where you are engrossed in that there's nothing wrong with that okay okay i take it thank you bharadwaj yes just wanted to piggy back off of what you had said also in in more of a a practical aspect that swami has told my father and i when we had been able to go see swami in an interview my father i've never seen my father cry but i that was the first time i saw him cry my father and i immediately began to cry my mother was sick everything was going on swami stopped the interview and told my father in hindi and told my me in english stop crying crying is a waste of time 
Swami is right before you. Be happy, be happy, be happy. Right, but I'm crying right now. So, and when he said, when he, every time you see that, anytime you go through a depressive state or anything, yes, these are tears of joy. You know, you experience the birth of a child, a promotion, you, you closed on a house, a, you know, something of that sort. Yes, you, you, you express tears of joy. But when you have the divine mother and father right in front of you, yeah, you, you may sob and everything, but cherish that time. Because think of that. Those five seconds that my father and I cried, that's five extra seconds we could have had in the interview that Swami could have told us X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Swami had took the opportunity to remind us, hey, okay, be happy. Don't waste the time. You let it out. Now I'm right before you. Remember that. That's yeah. another way also. It doesn't always work though. Yeah. But, <laughs> I don't but see all the... It's all, something for you to always at least keep in the back of your mind. That's like, so true. Like that's, what Chris and Rishi are saying. Right. Uh, Chris and Rishi are saying. But also even just remember that. Just be happy. You start to cry. What brings you joy? You're seeing Sri Sakya Sai before you. I know. I know. I so they, you know. I'm so glad you said that, uh, brother. Because, um, so on the small narration. Sorry, I didn't want me to digress. But when, um, when my brother and my family and my mother and I used to go to Parthi every year. Swam used to make it a tradition that on the last day of the trip, the capstone would be an interview. And then he'd tell us to go straight to the airport from there. Don't talk to anyone, don't interact with anyone, go straight. And so throughout the trips to Parthi, we would come to expect that on the last day, Swami was going to call, we'd prepare, we're, you know, dress up and all that stuff. And towards the later part of, of Swami's avatarhood, he started creating that distance in preparation for his samadhi. And so sometimes he would not call, sometimes he would call. And there was one instance where uh, Mahashivratri Swami called us for an interview the day before our interview. And we had been waiting for the past couple of days and Swami not call. And so we were all very stressed in that. And when he called us in the interview, all of us were sitting there. And my, my mother, you know, in her overwhelmingly, overwhelming love for Swami, burst out into tears in, in the interview room. And Swami's face changed from... Daya, like the Antaryami Dayanidhi to absolute Narasimha Swaroop. He said, hey, stop crying. The Swami would hate when anyone would cry. So I'm so glad you brought that up because Swami, Swami's form of devotion is always pure joy. Everything is happiness. For, for the want of one more small digression, um, you know, as when you're a child, you really don't understand what crying tears of joy means. I shared this at the flushing talk last week. Um, as a child, crying is always associated with a happy feeling. And then, you know, when I was like five or six years old, and I would hear all these guest speakers at Sai Centers talk about, oh, when we see Swami, we are in pure Ananda and we are crying tears of joy. It's so hard for a child to comprehend that because crying is always associated with a negative emotion for children. But the first time I traveled to Parthi as an eight-year-old, um, by then Swami had already had a hip fracture. So he was, you know, unfortunately coming in the car. But even that, just as the car rolled into the cycle with Paul and the chandelier is reflecting off of his windshield, I still remember to that day, I broke down in tears. And that was the moment that I realized, wow, this is what it means to cry tears of happiness. So it's, of course, it's a natural expression, but let me clarify one thing. Everything that I'm mentioning in this workshop about bhajans, this is purely about having bhajans in the Sai Center, in congregation. When we are at home in, with our families or privately with Swami in our altar rooms, you are free to burst out in whatever way you wish. This, all of this information that we're providing is purely for conducting bhajans at the center and how we can make this, this sadhana of doing bhajans together conducive for everyone else and, you know, leading them on the path to experiencing Swami's presence. So, yes. Um, so now let's go into the actual exercises of how we should, where do we start when we, when I, I keep saying bhajan practice, bhajan practice, what is the starting point? So first is the base practice. So first you have, everyone should, you know, take the help of a Shruti box or a Tanpura app. Um, you can, there's free versions you can download on any smartphone. Um, and then, you know, iPhone has this iTabla Pro. Even if you don't have a smartphone, 
actually I can show you on the no. internet. Uh, there is a, um, I'm gonna share my whole desktop here. Disclaimer, we're not sponsored by them. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this guy who manufactures flute called Anubod and he has an online Tanpura that he's created. So if you just Google this Anubod Tanpura, virtual live Tanpura, this is a wonderful tool that I always use. And you can, you know, choose any pitch of your comfort and it's right there. So, so you don't need to know really, you know, you really don't need to know music per se to understand what this is. Of course, it's a very good idea to have a general understanding of the notes, you know, on the harmonium or, you know, piano is what a CD, but it's not really necessary. All you have to do, if you're completely new to this, start on any random letter, right? Like, and pick any simple bhajan, like love is my form. Um, I'm just picking the letter A, right? Love it. And you hear that tone. Hear that shruti. And try to sing whatever simple bhajan you pick. Try to sing it to that pitch. And then you'll realize, oh, this is a little too high for me. This is a little too low. And then you can adjust accordingly. So... Love is my form, truth is my breath, bliss is my food, my life is my man. This is a little comfortable because this bhajan has a very limited range. Um, this is an A. But generally for, for the two genders, right, for males, generally the comfortable pitch to sing most bhajans, um, again, this changes with the ragas and everything, like something that has a limited range like love is my form, I would sing it in a much higher pitch than like I would do that probably in C sharp or D. So pick one pitch that you're comfortable with. Don't even think about the bhajans for just pick one pitch, right? For example, I do my morning bass practices in D. So if I pick D and then chant Omkaram to this pitch. Now, before we get into that, what is the right way to chant Omkaram? The in one of the discourses in the 1995 World Conference, Swami explained that we spell OM as O-M, but it is truly to be spelled as A-U-M. So the A, U, M, the A has to come from the Nabhi or the stomach. The U comes from the Hidaya or the chest. And the M comes from the lips. So in essence, from a spiritual science perspective, this activates all the chakras that line all the way from the Muladhara chakra all the way to the Sahasrara chakra. So when we first when we chant Om, we should take a deep breath. And now when we breathe during this exercise, or when we breathe during bhajans, of course, after you've built that stamina by doing that breathing exercise, you should treat the stomach like a balloon. You know, I'm slightly overweight, but don't be shy. You know, you don't have to try to suck in during bhajan sessions. Just Swami is there with you. Um, Treat the stomach like a balloon. You fill up. And then when you naturally start chanting Om, you know, have, have that right posture, have your head up and straight. And then when you say, ah, it'll naturally come from the Nabi. Ah, ooh, mm. And then if we do it really correctly, then you will really feel that vibration in your head. Um, you know, in, in the Narayana Suktam, there's a line that says, Tatsya shikhaya madme paramatma vevasita, that, that at, atma, the light of divinity is right here in the shikha, the top of the head. So when we chant Om, we should really try to focus our attention to the top of our heads. And so this not only be, this, this is all, like I said, positive feedback loop. It's not just, it will help you physically to sing, but it will also help us on our spiritual progress when we do these sadhanas. So Pick any pitch that you're comfortable with. As I said, I generally pick D. So we can all chant Om together. <laughs> Breathe in. You can either do it through your nose or your mouth, whatever is more comfortable. I still have some blocked sinuses, sinuses so I do it through my mouth. <laughs> um. uh. 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 
feel that vibrate physically try to imagine that vibration moving upwards your body and hitting your head now it doesn't end here this is why actually it's so amazing how swami has designed the daily schedule in prashant and lim we chant omkaram 21 times every day in the morning not only is that important from a spiritual standpoint but physically chanting that omkaram early in the morning opens up our vocal cords and our larynx so that we're able to sing comfortably when it comes time for morning bhajans at 9 am but the the true way to do this practice is you have you're singing om and then if you're familiar with the music go down one note at a time so what i usually do, i'll just do like i'll do it in a fast motion but i do it very slowly in the car usually so i do om 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 and on a good day i can try to get down all the way to the lower d like the lower octave d if you're not familiar with the musical notes you can physically just move the tanpura button down so you chanting om Om, om. And I would say hold each note for as long as you can, and do Om at least three to five times on each note, and go as further down as you can. Om, om, om. And you'll notice as you continue to do this practice. after a week or two your range will come lower and lower and lower in the human voice because that singing in that lower pitch helps us to open up our vocal cords that will then physically allow your voice to hit those high notes with super clarity when we sing another practice that was suggested by pandit uh, jasraj um when he visited um swami once and he actually gave a concert in the prashanti mandir then he spent a great deal of time with uh the the music college students he said he suggested this practice of instead of just doing om you can also do it with hari om so we can chant it as um hari om and of course progressively get lower and lower and lower and lower and the the beauty of doing it in hari om you actually see when we just do om that's mostly vowels with the letter m when we do hari om we're touching different consonants and so we're training our mouths to hit those pronounce those consonants correctly when we sing bhajans in different pitches because just the consonant of ha is contained in so many bhajans the the consonant of ra is contained in so many bhajans so by doing hari om you're introducing many more consonants in that exercise and so when we sing it's important you know this also plays again like i said positive feedback loop all these exercises even though they're focused on one area are going to help you in 10 different other areas that you don't even realize so when it comes to bhajans pronouncing is very important as you know sanskrit is a you know as difficult of a language as it is pronouncing mispronouncing the words or giving emphasis in different areas sometimes may completely change the meaning of that line even in english right when i want to say this is my water bottle if i say this is my water bottle meaning this object is my water bottle not this laptop not this microphone not this arm this is my water bottle that's what that means when i say this is my water bottle that means this is mine this is not sandeep uncle's this is not bharat this is not krish this is my water bottle this is my water bottle this is water inside there is no coffee lemonade juice this is water bottle and if you say this is my water bottle this is a bottle this is not a bag like you get in india you get the milk bags or something you get the drinking water in the package right this is a water bottle so when we put the emphasis on the right words and the right syllables makes a huge difference in how we convey the meaning of the bhajans
Ravi Kumar uh, Bhaiya gave one very precious example of this. There's the bhajan. Raghava Sundar Ram Raghuvar. There's one line. Ravana Mardhana Vigna Vanjana. Many people make the mistake of singing Ravana Mardhana. So, like Rishi was saying, Brother Rishi was saying, the emphasis on the words is very important. Why should the emphasis be on Ravana? When we're singing about Rama's glory, instead the emphasis should be on on Rama on Rama killing Ravana. So instead of Ravana Mardana, very easy. You're singing a concert like you know Carnatic saga, but instead the emphasis should be Mardana. Ravana Mardana Vigna Banjana. Small differences like that, but it is very very important. So I'm just giving multiple examples like that. And then that also plays into the different variations we do in bhajans. So the how we sing a bhajan should reflect the mood of that bhajan. Um, if you're singing a bhajan like our voices should, you know, while following all the breathing techniques, our voices should be so we're asking for daya, we're asking for forgiveness from Swami. But that same theory, if you apply to Om Shivai, Om Shivai, it doesn't work, right? So we have to fit the mood of that bhajan, the bhava of that bhajan to the to the the way we actually deliver and sing that bhajan. Um, and of course, this is why Swami has said. Nama Sankirtana is the best because we don't need to worry about any of this. We are just purely in the bliss of chanting Swami's name, which is why of the four Sankirtanas that we discussed last time, Nama Sankirtana is the easiest. And even in this Kali Yuga, as we say, you know, the, the popular shloka goes, Harid Nama, Harid Nama Eva Kevalam, Kalau Nasti, Kalau Nasti, Nasti Eva Gatiranyatha. In this age of Kali, it is only the Nama Sankirtana, chanting the name of God that will take us across the ocean of samsara this worldly existence in the treta yuga you know people had to undertake so many spiritual austerities just to have a glimpse of god in kali yuga all you have to do is open up your app mm. open up your phone and google satya sai baba and you're seeing god <laughs> or you can go on youtube pop, pop up any uh, you know this is uh, type satya sai baba you have millions of darshan videos so fortunate this is the only avatar that has allowed himself to be videographed audiographed and we have so much of wealth of media that Swami has left behind for us. So we should really, you know, take advantage of that. So speaking of, you know, developing this bhava and bhajans, um, there's many different um, techniques of how we can develop this bhava. So first is the attitude that we have in the bhajan session. As we mentioned last week, we should be humble. This is an exercise. We are doing a bhajan is one of the greatest forms of service. Yes, Narayana Seva is important. Medical Seva is important. But when we do bhajans, particularly at the Sai Center, we are doing the Seva to everyone else in the congregation because we become that conduit of divine love to transfer that vibration and every transfer that vibration to all the devotees in the congregation. So as I mentioned last week, paired singing is one of the ways, if you're, especially if you're a newer singer um, and trying to learn more, uh, paired singing is very important. In fact, in Parthi, as of 2008, paired singing has been mandatory for the Prashanti Bhajan group. Of course, that's changed a little bit with COVID because it's kind of hard to do paired singing and, you know, without social distancing. But now with cases coming down, you know, it's, uh, you know, hopefully we can get back to that in-person vibe and you know, singing more paired bhajans, you know, as Auntie mentioned, I like to have a kind of bhajan for my birthday. And so for the first two hours and the last three hours, we make sure that all the bhajans are sung in pairs and that the energy that that gives is just beyond description. As I mentioned, if you have eight people, four men and four women, in, and you have to sing eight bhajans, instead of giving each person one bhajan, personally, I would prefer you pair and create two pairs on each side and give each pair two bhajans to sing because singing those bhajans in paired one it helps us it forces us to select simpler bhajans it forces us to cut down on the variations for those who are trained in classical music 
And it forces us to have that humility because this is a group sadhana that we are doing. And it also forces us to practice because you can't sing without practicing. You can't sing together without practicing. Exactly. It's very important to recognize bhajan is not a concert. And a lot of times, especially for those who are trained, it's very tempting to take that moment and you're, you're, you're soloist or whatever. But uh, the bhajan is not about you. The whole it's, it's counterintuitive to come to a bhajan and then revert back to ego more about how I am singing, how other people are hearing me singing, how someone is going to tell me how well I sang after bhajan. None of that matters. None of that. So when it comes to if you're the lead singer, making sure that you're able to sing such that everyone's able to repeat, making sure you don't have such complex thans and sargams inside that everyone's just like not able to repeat at all. And the same thing goes for instrumentalists also. So uh, one, one thing that Swami is very strict about for tabla players, for example, is you'll see some tabla players who are very classically trained will do a lots of different, you know, little variations in between every single line of the bhajan. Every single line has some complex little thing, some naka, some kaida, something like that. And that's not appropriate. And even that goes for classical music too. But bhajan, the focus should be on the bhajan, on the bhava and on swami, not on the intricacies of how everyone's playing instrumentals. And oh, wow, that was amazing. So when you're both leading and when you're accompanying also, the focus should be on the bhajan. And that has to be very, it's a very subtle balance. Of course, doing it too platonic as well is, is not uh, that great as well. But it should cater to the type of that bhajan. Personally, when I play tabla, I try my best to avoid the complex variations, but I try to contour the beat of the tabla to every individual line of the bhajan. So, for example, um, if you don't mind me just quickly showing. So, if, if um, singing a bhajan um, like, um, like, uh, Kala titaya, that comes out really good. Right. So Kala titaya. So if we, if I strictly played very simply, right. Kala titaya, Siddhi rupaya, Yogi shwedaya namo. I could very well maintain the same kind of beat throughout the entire bhajan. But to give it that little bit of extra oomph, if we cater that beat to the actual bhajan, it just adds so much of punch. So, Kala titaya, siddhi rupaya, yogi shwaraya namo. Now the same thing goes for like slower bhajans, like sa, so sairam saisham. I, it's, it's a six beat bhajan, right? You also have faster bhajans like Jagadishwari, Dayakaroma and six beat or sai nama bolo, govinda nama bolo. Theoretically, mathematically, I can apply the same beat to Sairam Sai Shyam and Jagadishwari Dayakaroma. I can do Sairam Sai Shyam. It doesn't sound nice. Sairam Sai Shyam. The same time, if I apply the same beat to Jagadishwari Dayakaroma, Jagadishwari Dayakaroma. Doesn't, but for that, this beat Jagadishwari Dayakaroma. So it's very important that we have an under every bhajan that we sing. It's very important that we have an understanding of what we are playing, what we are singing. That brings me to a very sensitive topic: how to choose the right bhajan for yourself. We hear bhajans on Radio Sai, we hear them in different albums, Bhavanjali and Bridge Across Time. Um, and we want to sing those bhajans. You know, <laughs> I have made that mistake so many times. I heard, I was listening to um, Bridge Across Time. This happened right, you know, right after like Swami had, uh, Swami Samadhi. I heard this bhajan, Sundar Padam Sai Padam, and I loved it. And, you know, just a week after Swami had passed, it was like a big program that was held. And I signed up to sing this bhajan. Turns out I show up and after singing the first line, I forgot what the next line was. I ended up singing the first line like four times until I remembered what the subsequent <laughs> lines were. So it's important when you choose a bhajan, it's important that first you learn it, you practice it a hundred times ideally, but choose a right bhajan that is suited for your musical ability and your voice. Right now, as I'm, I'll put myself as an example, I'm in a very vulnerable state right now. I have a I'm recovering from a sinus infection. My voice is raspy. Right now, if I try to attempt some singing something like it's not going to come out good. 
But if I pick a simpler bhajan, like Jay Guru Kara, Jay Jay Sadguru Kara, it comes out much smoother without any difficulty. So we should be very self aware of where our musical abilities lie. There is not, there's no such thing as greater or better or lower or worse. Swami has gifted human beings alone have this wonderful ability to put tune two words. I guess birds have that too, but, uh, <laughs> but human beings alone have this ability to articulate music, you know, words through music. When we, if we're having this, if we're just having this conversation with someone, right? It's, it's kind of, you know, very baseline. But if you put those words into poetry, it gets more emotion. But if you put tune to that poetry, that is the ultimate height of expression of the human expression. And this voice that Swami has given us is truly his gift. So, you know, this is advice to myself. We should take better care of our voices, but we should also be self-aware of our capacity. You know, if you're starting out to practice bhajans, as I said last time, there is a bhajan for everyone. No one should be inhibited from singing bhajans. It is just that the right bhajan should be selected. And that goes for your shruti also. You have to be aware of your particular range. And everyone has a different particular range. And by the same token, every bhajan has a, a the uh, its appropriate shruti. So not every bhajan is meant to be sang at the same shruti. So if your shruti is A, for example, not all bhajans sound good in A. And you have to be able to realize and choose those. So for example, but my weak point tends to be my lower register, my courage. And Karan, my twin, is my complement to that, his strength and his courage. So when we sing together, it's perfect. But for a bhajan like Hari Om Tat Sat Nama Shivai. So if I'm if my voice is higher, I can't, it, it doesn't sound good to sing Hari Om Tat Sat Nama. The, the bhajan doesn't sound appropriate. And you won't be able to hit the high note. Shiva, yeah. Shiva, Shiva, Nama exactly. Shiva. So it's important to pick the right pitch of the bhajan, which is why it is very important as I see this, everything is ties into each other. Very important to come to center early, practice your bhajan with Sandhi Pankul or Sandhari Anti, and make sure that they give you that right pitch for that bhajan. And when they give you that pitch before you start the bhajan, wait to hear, even if it takes you a little bit more than three or four seconds, wait, internalize that pitch that they give you, right? If you're going to sing... Um, Gopala Radha Lola. Um, if they give you this pitch, don't first wait for that. One of the common mistakes that I've seen, people will they'll get the mic and they'll start singing Gopala Radha Lola. And then there's a dash for the harmonium player to figure out like where the note is. You'll hear this going on, right? And then I've also I've also seen when harmonium play again, this is not too to defame anyone this is we're all family here and this is just i'm just sharing some mistakes that i have made and the observations that i have seen sometimes you know if the harmonium player is singing and they suddenly decide to sing a bhajan and they may not know what their pitch for that bhajan is so they'll just randomly hit a note they want to sing mahadeva maheshwara <laughs> right so they'll hit maha maha Mahadeva Maheshwara. It's very important to know what your pitch of the bhajan is. And if you if you if you don't have the musical knowledge to do that, getting familiar with tools like the Tanpura, just try your best, even if you're not trained in classical music, play that drone sound. Try your best to match your voice. You know, the, every human being has the innate ability to know if they're on pitch or not. It just takes a little bit of getting used to a little bit of practice yes so rishi rishi brings up a point as far as practice rishi just saying mahade mahadeva maha 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 <laughs> about six seven years ago it was myself rishi and dhyanish that were sitting next to the person that was doing maha 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 <laughs> and rishi looks at both dhyanish prabhu and i and says right at the same time doesn't miss a beat this is why you practice. Maha Deva. And then all of a sudden the bhajan started. And Dhyanesh and I's face were beat red because Rishi just said it mm. so quickly. And we couldn't even 
say anything to him because the budget had started. So now we're sitting there beat red and I'm looking at Rishi. I go, okay, I'm going to kill Rishi after this. <laughs> so yes, practice. <laughs> well, always consider the highest line of the bhajan. So for example, take a bhajan like Pratasmaranam Sri Rama, right? It starts very low, so it's very deceiving. Pratasmaranam Sri Ramam. But the highest line is so high. Anandadayaka Sri Ramam. If you don't know what pitch that is, then you'll start at a very wrong pitch. So always consider the highest note of the bhajan. Yes. Would we always challenge ourselves? Uh, I make this, this mistake all the time, you know, what you were saying. I listen to something and it sounds so good and I, I want to practice it and I want to do it. Is it okay to challenge myself? Not at the size end. <laughs> Let's see, if you were, imagine if you, if you were at Prashanti Nilayam, right? And Swami's sitting on the dais in front of you. Would you would you ever go in front of him with a trial of a bhajan, right? No, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean yeah. That. Huh. That's totally fine. As yeah. If you sang it over, <laughs> if you sang it over a hundred times. So I have a I have a question for you guys then. Yeah. If you come to the Sai Center, right? And they hit, there's seven budgets that are on the screen. Yeah. And everybody gives the seven budgets, and they're some of the most horrible budgets you've heard. And you go home. How do you feel leaving the center? No, no, no. <laughs> say, no, no, no. I'm, I'm asking very seriously. How do you feel so, leaving the center? These are seven singers who didn't practice, who thought they were the producers of Bridge Across Time, and who thought they were they were better than Ravi Kumar and <laughs> Now, if you get seven singers that that the, that, that the, is some very high level audacity. <laughs> Now, if you get seven people that practice you know, seven simple songs, uh, budgets. Budgets, seven simple budgets that people, now you leave here, wow, the budgets were nice. I'm uplifted. Yeah. I was able to receive it. Think of, think of the mindset. I say that because Rishi has told me this several years ago. But also, you, it goes back to a point that Brother Rishi made earlier, is that it's not always also about the, the lead singer, but also the repeaters. So you may have challenged yourself to learn that bhajan and it sounds beautiful, but when you come in the Sai Center and sing that, then the chorus may not be familiar with that bhajan, may not have sung it. And that's an equally important part of the, the whole atmosphere of bhajan. And, other th and the other thing also for all of us to kind of look at it also, some of the bhajans, you know, the composer would have composed in a certain way and you could have your own versions of it. Like for example, when Ravi, some of the bhajans he sings, is, I call it his, his own version of like the original version. Because it's not the same as what the original person composed. And, and Ravi is the first one to admit that he cannot sing the same way because the way it was composed. For example, like Jai Kaila Shapate Shambho was composed by Sonam Bhaiya, but that one was, he's composed it in a different way and only he can sing it that way. It's very hard for, and then Ravi yes. just adapts himself to that one. And he's the first one to uh, you know, admit that sometimes, you know, I, I, I can't do that thing like Satya Sai Smaranam, I cannot sing that way. Right. And he's the, you know, the humility, the singer in him, you know, he kind of brings it up saying, same thing for all of us. Yeah. We can have our own version, simplify it and make sure what works for the, the group here. And we sing and we don't have, we can challenge ourselves. We practice, practice and times. have Alka's, Alka's version of it might not be the same as what we've heard and we want to aspire, but we can tone it down and keep it simple too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I that's it. a very important point. Because otherwise, one would never sing the context is very important. So if you're, for example, in a setting where there are many people around who will be familiar with the bhajan or who can sing chorus appropriately, that's a good avenue to introduce it initially. And then slowly but surely, as people, more and more people are exposed to that bhajan, they've heard it a number of times, then it can be brought out to a, a larger audience. And I think Roshi actually is a top. Yeah. Uncle, uncle had a, you had something to say? Yeah, most of the time we come here to learn and we evolve here. And uh, just like Paul KJ said, sometimes she practices some note. And when she comes here, somebody tell her to go for another high, uh, another two high. Mm. And, uh, amazingly, she uh, sings in that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, this is also every day is a kind of a learning session for us. 
Yes. One, one thing like uh, Rushdi said last time that uh, when you're singing in congregation, the, you know, it's not that you singing, all the other people can follow along, but yeah. that's the energy comes, right? Yeah. So if you have two yeah. people sitting here, two people sitting here, you're singing the Jai Kalash Pate, you, it's not going to maybe work because you may sing it, you may practice 100 times, but look at the audience you have yes. in the center. Can you bring that vibration? You know, so that's the also important when you come here, you have two people sitting here, two people sitting here. You practice really good bhajan, you can deliver it, but can other people sing together or not? Because the energy comes from the audience. So that's very important to look at your audience also. Like if we have Rushi Ji and all these people are there, right? You can bring that energy through the audience. But if you have very few people following you, people do the same simple bhajan. So that everyone can follow. And it's easy to bring the energy you need in that. Because you know, it's, it's a part of you. It's about everyone together. Uncle brings up a very good point about how we select the bhajans that we want to sing. Um, as Bharadvaj mentioned, you know, I would rather sit through a bhajan of like eight very simple Nagar Sankirtan type bhajans than sit through eight very classical bhajans that were completely butchered. Right? It's of course it's nice to have a different variety of different types of bhajans, but it's better, you know quality is always better than quantity quantity in the terms of the variety of quantity that we have of different bhajans that we sing quality 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 is always what swami expects from us so first important point in selecting the bhajans is of, of course you know our own musical abilities and as i gave the technique last time recording yourself you all have a smartphone now right record yourself and the innate human ability is already there to tell you if you sang well or not so record yourself that's a very good self measurement tool Beyond that, as uncle mentioned, Swami gave these two words, samayam and sandarbham, time and circumstance are very important to select what bhajan you want to sing. If, as uncle mentioned, if we're in a small setting and um, you just take a general pulse of the room, if you know that, you know, these are not entirely trained mus classical musicians and it's only four people, you need to sustain that energy. So pick simpler bhajans. If you have a room full of YAs who are all classically trained, sure, go for all these wild, fancy buttons. Um, all, all, you know, you can go all out in that case. But it's all about the time and circumstance. And even when it comes to, um, let's say you have a guest speaker. And after the guest speaker, some bhajans have to be sung. Um, typically, that's what happens in Kulu and Thalright. Bhajans are always the end of the program. After a guest speaker is done, or any music program that's offered in Parthi, You'll notice all the bhajans that are sung are always fast and upbeat. After, if it's if it's just the Vedam and the bhajan session, yes, you'll have the full variety of bhajans that are sung, fast, slow, medium. But if some program is being offered to Swami and then there's a short bhajan session after, you'll notice all the bhajans are very fast and upbeat because you've sat through this long one hour talk. You've enjoyed the talk. You've gained all of that knowledge. You want to end that session on a lively note. So, situation like that, make sure to select simpler, faster bhajans. For example, in 2019, um, you know, in my capacity as the former um, lead of the International YA Music Committee, I had the opportunity to lead a music program in Sai um, the day before Guru Purani. And so we had a wonderful program. It was about 45 minutes long. And a couple of days before, I'm like, hey, this music program practice is going really well. What if we after our program, the Prashanti Bhajan group was supposed to sing the regular bhajans. And I approached the international YA coordinator at the time and requested him, hey, brother, can we, can we also just do the bhajan session after we're done with the music program? And he was a, a bit wary, you know, you're here for the music offering. We need to make sure that quality is presented. We don't want you guys getting distracted by also having the bhajans on your plate. But I said, brother, I think, you know, things are going well. I think we can manage it. So he, along with the Dr. Narendra Nath Reddy and a few members in the Central Trust, one time came to the shed where we were practicing. They heard the music program practice. They were very pleased. They said, you know, you guys are doing great. If you guys want to do bhajans, you're approved. You can go ahead and also plan for the bhajan session. So it was the one and only bhajan session so far that I've had the opportunity to organize in Kulvanthal. And of course, while I love music in general, bhajans is, for me, is the crux of everything. So once we knew we had this opportunity to organize bhajans. I think I gave so much more attention to the bhajans than the actual music program. But anyways, I made sure that 
the bhajans that are group selected, because we had already done this long music program for 45 minutes, I made sure that the bhajans selected were all fast, upbeat bhajans, and at minimum had three speeds. <laughs> um, and after that bhajan session was done, um, Sai Surindranath uncle, who's one of the tabla players in the bhajan group, approached me and said, you know, you guys broke the record for a number of third speed bhajans in one bhajan session. And Sai <laughs> So, you know, keeping that time and circumstance in mind, you know, on Krishna Janmashtami for celebrating Lord Krishna's birth, we sing bhajans like Krishna, oh Krishna, mujhe darshan do Krishna. It's beautiful, but you're asking Krishna to give you darshan, but he's already taken birth. It's his birthday. Why don't we sing bhajans like Jai Hari Krishna? Let's welcome him into our midst, right? Jai Hari Krishna. Even on Swami's birthday, like I narrated the experience that my grand grandfather had shared with me. With Swami's birthday, let's avoid bhajans like Daya Guru. Instead, let's sing bhajans like Sai Jagannatha. Hey, sa, and let that session. See, when we celebrate festivals at the center, it's not just about the altar and the decoration, but the choice of music, the choice of bhajans really plays a key role. And so let's go a little bit into the preparation side of bhajans from an overall, now we've kind of touched on how we perfect that individual unit, how we make each bhajan perfect. How do we make the whole session perfect? And of course, a heavy responsibility lies on the devotion coordinator or the bhajan coordinator of the center. But it is not just, it's their responsibility and at the end of the day, the, the onus lies on them, but it is a responsibility of the entire center to be aware of these uh, guidelines so that we can help the devotion coordinator and help the center in having a conducive bhajan session. Um, so but devotion coordinator has you know, two key responsibilities, the selection and the sequencing of bhajans. Going back to what I was saying earlier, when we should be self-aware of our musical abilities, I implore all of you, if your devotion coordinator asks you to select a simpler bhajan, please, for God's sake, do not be offended. <laughs> because it is their responsibility that this collective session that is being offered to Swami in it as a whole sounds good. It is the singer's responsibility to make sure the bhajan, the singing sounds good, right? But it is the devotion coordinator's responsibility. So please, I urge all of you, I'm sure this is not a problem here, um, but let us have the humility to understand that when we're asked to select an alternate, I understand this is a very sensitive topic. I've had, you know, as in my experience as a, serving as a DC, I've had so many times where someone will come to me saying, Sairam Rushi, I want to sing this bhajan. I practiced it, you know, all week. And it'll be a bhajan where they'll be like, it's like, Sita Rama, Shri Rama. But oh my God, it will be like totally all over the place. To the point where, you know, as much as people are singing with bhava and emotion and we shouldn't laugh at them, but we're human, right? The natural instinct for me is to just chuckle inside. Um, because it, it, it was just that, hilarious uh, how it registered in, in my head. It's the devotion cord as sensitive as this is and as you know blatant this may sound, it is the devotion coordinator's responsibility to make sure the button session is good, but it is also their responsibility to ensure that you do not become the laughing stock of the center. Um, that way, I think our center is very blessed that way, you know, people take it on their stride <clears throat> and uh, you know, we have like said to people like, can you please do you you know sing a separate in a different bhajan or can you try it another week? And people have been very accommodating in our center. It's like again, we put Swami first and then we also laugh a lot, so you don't know who's laughing. <laughs> 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 and we also give open good feedback to mm -hmm. people saying that you know this is good try but please refrain from trying here you should hear the feedback in the driveway oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so would say you know like oh, this is, you're not ready for this yeah. she would say that yeah. and you have to take it yeah. you know, you all the other way around like you think oh yeah you've got to go you can do it yes. yeah. oh yeah challenging so yeah it's 
it's so great to hear that we have a very family like conducive environment to having good bhajans in this touch wood but uh, i i wish i was i i love my center but i wish you know some folks had the same level of humility that that we have for example right now like you know i i shouldn't with my voice situation i shouldn't attempt hard bhajans i we should all have that self awareness you know when we have when we're selecting the bhajans let's make sure that you know they're in line with with our musical abilities the next is the sequencing of the bhajans so thankfully you have people like dipendar uncle and sandri aunty to sort that out for you but let's say it's an open bhajan session and it's just open mic and the the and the mic is being passed around you should be aware of what kind of bhajan i should sing when i get the mic so shivratri is an odd ball because it's an akhanda bhajan for 12 hours, for 10 hours right this year 8 pm to 6 am um but let's say you're sitting for a 1 hour open bhajan session where there's no list and you know the bhajan is going to go from 10:30 am to 11:30 am if you get the mic at 11:20 am for god's sake please do not sing a slow bhajan or if you get the mic right after the ganesh bhajan for god's sake please do not sing something like allah akbar because swami has given this wonderful technique of how bhajans should be sequenced it's a check mark format i'm sure sandri aunty dipendar uncle you're all familiar with this already so when a bhajan session starts to start with a not necessarily a fast but very energetic ganesh bhajan people have driven all the way to the center they may have had you know some road rage on the way here cursing out the dr- fellow drivers on the road they're coming to the center there was an incident last time we came we won't talk about that <laughs> that he saw the whole thing happen and he says ah ahimsa ha huh? i said i just keep driving <laughs> let's say you have a ganesh bhajan like a uh, we'll pick very simple right um see I'm, i don't know my pitch so i'm doing that say maha 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 mistake right ganesh sharanam sharanam gani so that bhajan is sung with that liveliness now if i take that same ganesh bhajan i sing it slowly ganesh sharanam sharanam gani sha gani sounds very good for an unplugged version of a, some youtube cover from trying to do sure great do it in a bhajan session that just doesn't fly because the ganesh bhajan starts the bhajan session you want to if people have come with so many different emotions in their head you need to capture their minds immediately that ganesh bhajan is sets the tone for the entire session of course we have many different kinds of ganesh bhajan we have slow ones as well like um gangana uh, my voice is not cooperating right now um but you have slow ones as well but even those ganesh bhajans should be sung with gusto with some energy um but that is why if you notice if you open brindamrutha when you go through the ganesh bhajan section there are actually very few slow ganesh bhajans most of the ganesh bhajans you notice are always upbeat they may not be super fast we have you know super fast ganesh bhajans like sundar sundar vinayaka jay jay gajanana gananatha sundari mukeshri gajanan all of which you could take to fourth speed uh with fog machines and fireworks but um but not most for most most ganesh bhajans you know generally two speeds you'll notice most of them with very few exceptions are fast and upbeat like pahi gajanan dinavana um tum ho vigna vinash even the minor scale like jay 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 ganayaka and this is innately designed because that bhajan session needs to start from a high point of the check mark so everyone comes in you gather their attention everyone is now attent then you feed in the slower bhajans okay now that i have your attention let us sing some slower bhajans like sai ram sai shyam mahadeva maheshwara pannaga shayana kaliyavatara then you can introduce some of the slower bhajans but if we keep singing slower bhajans <laughs> that bless you if we keep singing the slow bhajans then we will all fall asleep 
especially during shiva especially during shiva <laughs> so then after two three slow bhajans we increase in speed and energy and the check mark goes up 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 and end at the high crescendo and we end with fast bhajans at the end so that's how bhajan session should be organized another um rule is uh if possible try to avoid bhajans with similar characteristics to be sung back to back for example going back to an open bhajan concept if someone is singing um gopala radha lola and you've decided in your mind to sing jai hari krishna jai hari it's almost the same ragam it's the same deity and if that happens for two or three bhajans the bhajan becomes session becomes a little bit monotonous so we should try to especially in open bhajan try to come with a few options that you've practiced 100 times and are ready to sing so that if someone before you sings a bhajan which is similar to what you were planning to sing you have some alternate options in your back pocket um and that when we sequence bhajans for a bhajan session of you know bhajans are assigned it's important for the devotion coordinator to keep in mind that in an party they strictly follow this you will never hear two devi bhajans back to back you will never hear two krishna bhajans back to back or two rama bhajans of course navratri time different story janmashtami time different story shivratri time also different story we can have shiva bhajans for as long as we want but on a regular bhajan session on a sunday we should avoid having the same deity consecutively also goes with ragam if we have like three major bhajans back to back like gopala radha lola kamale netra sai ishwaram ishwaram va priyanandana they're all major scale bhajans and the session might start getting a little monotonous so if we mix it up with slightly minor bhajans that's better now again doing a whole bhajan session in minor bhajans is also not a great idea you start with like he shivanandan jay jagavandan then you do he vishwanath he gaurinath he sai nath bhagavan remind me it gets monotonous at the end of the day so trying to vary the different styles of bhajans that are sung by deity and then of course it's the length of the bhajan right as i mentioned to you guys when my high school project i did the whole like mathematical analysis of sai bhajans the average length of sai bhajans is 3.75 minutes let us not make that 8 minutes 6 minutes of course some bhajans are longer and they may hit that 5 minute mark um more on some with some exceptions of course if you have a third speed fourth speed you know that's it's fine to go a little bit over that 3.75 minutes let us be aware if it's a very long bhajan like prema mudita manasek was probably i think the longest bhajan or actually no like narayana narayana, narayana bhajan narayana is probably even longer than that narayana bhajan nar or please like do not sing that entire bhajan twice in the first each line twice in the first speed <laughs> each line once in the second speed you will end up singing that bhajan for more than 15 minutes if you do that of course back in the day in the patamandiram days when swami was the sole lead singer as i had shared last month swami would sing the rama bhagavan rama bhagavan rama bhagavan sai rama bhagavan krishna bhagavan he would sing that with every single deity and that bhajan would go on for 30 minutes that would be the only one bhajan in that entire session that is because swami was the only lead singer but that's not the case anymore we have all of us and we have to give everyone a chance to sing so and of course you know now that sai bhajans we went through the evolution of sai bhajans all the way dating back 600 years ago to guru nanak till now the 2020s of how sai bhajans have evolved and so we should stick with the current times and try to avoid you know longer bhajans if we do decide to sing longer bhajans let us be aware that either you know like narayan bhajan narayan if i if i've ever sung it in a bhajan session what i would do is sing each line once and it has four stanzas i would make each stanza one speed so i would sing it i would end up singing in four speeds of course not speeding up too fast because it does have longer words and longer lines so you know end of the day doing tana manaranjana bhavaya vandana asurani khandan it may not be appropriate so we have to be very self aware but if, if you take that bhajan and just slightly speed it up at every stanza and you sing each line once that's perfectly fine you'll still finish it in under 4 to 5 minutes so that's the deal with the 6 to 8 line rule so let's let's undertake a small exercise let's say 
uh, we have a guest speaker at the center. And after that, we only have about 20 minutes for a bhajan session. So we can accommodate five bhajans. And these are the five bhajans that you have to deal with on the screen. How would you sequence them? <laughs> Following the checkmark rule. Any volunteers? Of course. Start with Ganesh bhajan, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So so let's walk through the process of how we would sequence this. First, order the bhajans by the average tempo. Radhika Jivan is obviously the slowest. Then is maybe Gajanana, Gajavadana, right? Then we are blessed comes. Of course, I've done We Are Blessed with the three speeds. But that's a wild card, so ignore that. <laughs> Rama Raghura, Rama Sita come next. And Ganga Dara, you, they, the way that bhajan is sung in Prashanti Mandir, they sing it in three speeds, right? The first speed, they do it with six beat and then eight beat and then again in eight beat. So Ganga Dara is the fastest. By convention, we would always start with the Ganesh bhajan. So we move Gajana, Gajavadana as the first bhajan. Ensure that the non-consecutive rule is met. So we have a Ganesh bhajan, Krishna bhajan, one English bhajan on Swami, Rama bhajan, Shiva bhajan. So we don't have any consecutive issue. It's a short bhajan session, so we don't have that problem. So we're good on that front. No issues, the list is ready to go. So we should order the bhajans by the average tempo, of course, starting with an energetic bhajan session and then building up from there. Sorry? We can <laughs> algorithm. I believe uh, the Boston group has built something like that. And you know, as Krish was mentioning earlier, um, and feel free to chime in on this. Every bhajan has an innate speed that it was composed. Now, I'll talk a little bit about composing as well. What happens when bhajans? How are bhajans composed? Swami has, you know, given myself and Krish as well, you know, the opportunity to compose some bhajans and Sai bhajans are so unique because, you know, Bollywood songs or even any other devotional songs that have to be written like Kavalis or things, people will generally sit down with a harmonium. They'll have a theme in mind. They'll have a raga in mind. They'll start fiddling around. Then they'll start writing words. That's how songs, devotional songs are typically uh, composed. And even like Mira bhajans and things like that, you know, I mean, I'm not sure how, what Mira's composing process was 500 years ago, but, um, you know, typically nowadays, like the, the songs that like Pandit, uh, you know, Pand, uh, Anub Jalota and they all sing, they usually will sit down with a harmonium and compose a bhajan with that intention in mind. Sai bhajans are so unique because I think they're just a portal into the infinite universe because most of the times, and this experience is shared by so many Sai Bhajan composers, they will not have a harmonium on them or nothing. They will just be doing something completely random and the Bhajan just comes to them. It's as if, this, this is very abstract for me to understand as well, but it's as if all the Sai Bhajans that, are, that have existed, that currently exist and will exist at any point in the future, I believe that all Sai Bhajans already exist in the ether, the akasha, whatever you want to call it. It is a, at some point, Swami decides to pick one person and empowers him with that one bhajan and sends that bhajan through him. Mm -hmm. I have had so many different, and again, this is not to, I'm not trying to sound cocky or boast myself. This is only to glorify the divine grace of Bhagwan. I have been in the most awkward situations where bhajans have come to me. And I will have to, at that point, pull out my phone and start recording what's coming through my mind. Because if I don't, I have lost so many bhajans that way. Um, and so Sondari Anti brought up the point, you know, we may not be able to sing it like how the composer did. When Prashanti Mandir sings certain bhajans, I think that is the golden standard. So as much as possible, we should try to stick to that. Um, and they also try to, because Prashanti Mandir bhajans, as much as they may tweak a few things here and there, which is completely fine, they do try to stick to how the composer initially composed the bhajan as much as physically possible. Of course, when bhajans come raw, sometimes the tune may not be 
um, suitable for congregation, right? So of course, once a bhajan is composed, then I would maybe sit with the harmonium or I would share it with Krish or I would share it with my friend Siddhu and then they would offer some suggestions and we would tweak the bhajan, right? It's like you're taking milk from a cow. It has to be pasteurized before we drink it. So if the bhajan comes raw from Swami, of course, you know, we because our interpretation, if we may not be fully in tuned for that bhajan to come out perfectly through us. So once that bhajan comes, then we sit with the harmonium and then sort out the small kings. And then usually the, the adjustments are very, very few. Um, one time I, I was, when I was, uh, I shared this again with, with Flushing last week as well, uh, but for, you know, apologies for repeating it, but um, I, I had cardiac uh, issues when I was born. I had congenital heart defects. And so ev with Swami's grace, I'm completely fine now, but every year I have to go for a cardiac checkup. So this one year I went without my parents. I was completely alone. And on my drive back, a torrentially like torrential downpour of rain. And so one of the ragas that's associated with the rain is Miyaki Malhar. We have many beautiful bhajans in the raga, like ghana ghana neela vadana te sundar. And so I was listening to, um, because it was raining and I wanted to just, you know, I was sitting on traffic in the New Jersey Turnpike. And I was, that Miyaki Malhar was just ringing in my ears. And then I suddenly just broke out into this bhajan, um, which it goes like this. So see how Swami puts you in these situations. So Hridaya Spandana, what does it mean? So we worship Hridaya Spandana. Spandana means heartbeat. So we Hridaya Spandana means the beats of my heart. Sai Vandana, we're using our heartbeats as flowers to worship Swami. So Swami puts us in these situations, these bhajans is automatically come out. And so as much as possible, let us try to stick to how the composer has released the bhajan so that we are able to continue to tap into that infinite source of energy because end of the day, composers are, are just mere instruments. End of the day, Swami is the one who composes the bhajans. And for me, it was very, you know, I had the opportunity to attend global Akhanda bhajans in Atlanta. And surprisingly, I heard, you know, some of the bhajans that Swami had, had composed through me and Siddhu, I heard some of the bhajans being sung. And I don't think anybody realized that, you know, one of the composers was sitting in the congregation. And that to me was, you know, a bhajan is a hit when you don't know who the composer is. Mm -hmm. Some of the bhajans that we sing today, right? Men, we know who composed bhajans. And of course, if you do a little bit of gossip and really like dive deep into the whole, like the arena of bhajan composers, you might get to know who composed what bhajan. But there are, I would say 50% of the bhajans that are out there, nobody knows who composed. My favorite bhajan, for example, Shambho Shankar Deva. Till this day, I have no idea who composed that bhajan. Does anybody know actually? Right? Nobody. So you know a bhajan is super hit when nobody knows who the composer is, that it's only Swami. So even as composers, you know, having that humility and not, because bhajans is not something that is to be copyrighted or to have your claim on it. End of the day, as I mentioned, the bhajans already exist. It is just Swami is bringing, out, bringing them out through different composers. So that's just a little bit on the composing side. Um, you mentioned about, you know, chanting Omkaram, and uh, actually, how much time do we have still? We should wrap up. Yeah, yeah wrap sure. Up. Um, we went over all of these, you know, pranayama and practicing. And we have another one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to end with just one technique of, you know, we talked about bhava. We went over raga, tala, how to maintain that. But with bhava, how do we, what are some techniques to maintain have bhava in a bhajan session? And of course, this should come after raga and tala are taken care of. After you've done your hundred times of practice and you're finally sitting there in the session, how do I focus on the bhava of this bhajan session? So there's many different techniques. One is very simple visualization. I'm singing this bhajan. Swami is sitting on the throne and he's enjoying the bhajan. And that's, the, that's what I personally use. Um, but sometimes it might get a little distracting as well, right? Because the bhajan may be talking about Shiva, but you're trying to imagine Satya Sai Baba. 
So now Shivaratri is coming. One of the techniques for developing bhava in a bhajan is to imagine a story behind that bhajan. If you know how that bhajan was composed as well, you know, that's also a great way to have that bhava. If you know that or TV Hari Haran was in this situation, or, you know, Rushi was in this situation, or Ravi Raj Nasari was in this situation when this bhajan was composed, keeping that in the, you know, planting that seed in our heads might help us to have some bhava. So that's one more technique. Um, but one that I really like is to have a story behind a bhajan session, behind a particular bhajan. So you have any bhajan and you create a story behind it. So let's, we have Shivaratri coming up. So let's take this one bhajan, for example. It's a very simple bhajan. Many of you know it. Shiva Shiva Shambho, Hare Hare Shambho, Sai Shambho, Shankara. And, you know, this technique was shared by Prashanti Bhajan Group. So I'm just transmitting it to all of you and we'll, we'll end on this. So how do we take this bhajan and turn it into a story? So this bhajan starts, you know, Shiva Shiva Shambho, Hare Hare Shambho, Sai Shambho, Shankara. Imagine we're all group of friends and we're, hey, Let's go on a pilgrimage to Kailasha and have darshan of Shiva. Shivaratri is coming, right? Let's all go see Lord Shiva. So you're telling everybody, you're gathering everyone. And you're telling, Shiva, Shiva, Shambho, Hare, Hare, Shambho, Sagi, Shambho, Shankara. And then one of the friend, one of your friends asks, what's the point of going to, uh, going to Kailasa? You know, Swami is here or, you know, Shiva is everywhere. Swami is everywhere. Why should we go on this pilgrimage? Then you come out and say, no, no, when we go there, when we go to Kailasa, we will see Vyagrambare Dhare Vibhuti Sundar Sai Shampo Shankar. So you're reaffirming your faith. That, no, we should go on this pilgrimage. Vyagrambare Dhare Vibhuti Sundar Sai Shampo Shankara. And then one more person joins in bolstering that conviction and says, you know, not only will he be seated there in the, in the tiger skin and with the Vibhuti all over his body, but he will have the moon on his head. Chandra Kailadhare Shankara. Ganga will be fine. Ganga Jatadhare Shankara. And then a third devotee comes and says, you know, he will, he will be in bliss because he will be doing Tandav. Tandav Priyakar. Natanamanohar Hala Haladhare Shankara. And then again, you're with all these devotees. Everybody is convicted. And then you start making the plans for the trip. Vyagrambara. Fine, we're confirmed. Vyagrambara dhare vibhoti sundar sai shambho shankara. So trying to develop these little stories in our head. As I said in the beginning, if we pretend to be, we will tend to be, we will end up being that. Mm -hmm. So creating these little stories behind bhajan sessions really helps us as well. This is a wonderful exercise to make sure you understand the meaning of what you're singing. This Vyagram Bharadhara Vibhuti Sundar. For many people, this is just syllables and you don't understand exactly what these Sanskrit words mean. There's one beautiful story. Um, and one one time, like I mentioned, Swami would would always end our trip with, with an interview. And so one of the practices my mother used to do with, with me, my brother and my younger brother was to always make us practice one bhajan, the whole trip. And make sure we had it completely rehearsed and ready to go so that we could always sing one bhajan for Swami in the room. And one of the bhajans that we used to really enjoy singing was Sai Mata Pita Dina Bandhu Sakha. Swami used to tell us, these are my boys. So as our offering to Swami, we used to say, you are our mother, you are our father. And as the bhajan is written, you'll hear most people will sing it in the, in the middle of the bhajan. Mujhe shakti do mere sai shiva. Mujhe bhakti do mere sai shiva. Mujhe mukti do mere sai shiva. So when we got to that line, we started, we started saying, Mujhe shakti do. Swami said, stop, 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 stop. So all of us thought, oh my God, what did we do? We must have uh, rehearsed something wrong or must have sang some wrong note. And there was a moment of silence and you can just hear the fan rotating in the smell of his chandan coming from his gown. And he said, first comes Mujhe bhakti do. First comes bhakti. So before we ask for strength from Swami, before we ask for anything, first our devotion is, is the first and foremost thing that we have to keep in mind. And we ask him for so many things. We go to him and we pray, you know, so many small things. And we think that we're in control of everything. And ultimately it's complete surrender to him and complete devotion, which is the most important first step that we can take. And so, yeah, I, for example, I, with Swami's grace, hopefully one day, you know, my, um, fellowship of choice is cardiothoracic surgery. And so a lot of times I speak with my mother about, you know, how I can get there and all that. And it, with most jobs, networks and connections are very important. And so I, 
you know, I may stress out and say, oh, I have to have to impress so-and-so. I have to do this and that. I have to go out and do this. And my mom always tells me, why are you in control? Why are you, why are you feeling that you're in control? You know, why are you half-baked between it saying, oh, Swami will take care, but then all I, I also have to put my effort forward, right? Half A half-baked clay pot is just clay. It's a lump of clay. It's not a pot. So you, you have to give com- Swami your complete bhakti, complete surrender first. Then in turn, that bhakti then gives you shakti. Mujhe shakti. You have immense shakti then once you have that bhakti in Swami to do whatever whatever he asks you, every single part of his mission, you have that strength to, to carry out his work and to serve him because you have that bhakti inside of you unconditionally. And then in turn, in serving him without a thought, without ownership, without a, you know slightest bit of ego, Ultimately, that's mujhe mukti do mere sai shiva. That is mukti. Not some, you know, when you pass away, you may go to some heaven or something. Mukti is in life itself, when you have that oneness and connection with Swami. So Swami so beautifully exemplified how the, the smallest differences in, in, in each line of a bhajan so beautifully reflect the meaning and how we have to internalize that meaning. So from that point forward, our my brothers and I, whenever we sing this bhajan, we sing that in that order only. You may actually hear it now sung that way in Prashanti because we told some some Sai students also. But thank you for sharing that beautiful story. Yeah. End of the day, you know, that is the goal of bhajans that asking Swami to give us that bhakti, shakti, and mukti. At the end of all of this, to summarize, right, when, of course, we've put in that effort in preparing these bhajans for Swami, but end of the day, he is the singer. Anytime that I sit for bhajans to play tabla, I try to imagine that I'm just hollow and Swami's light and energy is just flowing through me. At the end of the day, we are the hollow flutes in his hands. And anytime, it, you know, it's it's not like throughout the bhajan, I keep reminding myself, but this beginning of the session, I just stop and I just, for that, even while just the Om is being chanted, right? I just imagine that I'm completely hollowed out. Swami's light is just, you know, transmuting into my body. And the, the I'm at the end of that session, I'm so satisfied with, you know, with the way I've played tabla or sang. And if I've forgotten to do that exercise before the bhajans, I've always felt, you know, some anxious. I know I could have done a little better. Um, end of the day, Swami is the singer, but we have to do the effort. If we take one step towards Swami, he will take a hundred steps towards us, but we have to take that one step. And that one step is the sadhana, all this practice and everything that we discussed in the last two sessions. At the end of the day, God will only help those who help themselves first. So we, if we do our effort and Swami sees that, they're guaranteed he will come and sing through us. And the end of the day, he is the bhajan, he is the listener, and he is the recipient. End of the day, we are doing this for his listening pleasure. And as we started this in Swami's name, we'll end this with my, this is out of all the quotes of Swami, this is my number one favorite quote, because whenever someone argues saying, why so much bhajan, why so much bhajan, realize that there is nothing greater than bhajan. What bliss is there in bhajans? What a demonstration of oneness it is when a myriad throats join in uttering the name of God. Swami has clearly said that there's nothing greater than bhajan. So let us not just take this as a mundane weekly exercise that we do at the center, but really internalize this and take this as a gift. End of the day, as, as I started you know, session one, Sai Bhajan is a unique genre of music that Swami himself created, and we are now the emissaries of that genre of music. So let us take that to heart and we conclude this with gratitude to all of you and to Swami for this wonderful opportunity to talk about this topic that is the most dear to my heart. And I hope I have given at least a bit of that love to all of you in these two sessions. And thank you to Sai Bharadwaj for uh, helping arrange and the center officers and Krish for coming and giving us his insights for this second session as well. Thank you so much. We'll end with the Om Shanti. I have to I have to share this with everyone because the center means a lot. Like I went through a very um, you know strange thing, and I felt like Krish came today and almost uh, reinforced what Swami is talking about bhakti and the thing. Sanskriti, my daughter has gone to DC yesterday, 
uh, on model UN, which is all good with this with her friends. And yesterday, and all of you know that she has food allergies and she's allergic to a lot of things. And yesterday was a very tough time we went through because she had an allergic reaction. And this was the first time we were not there when she had to, she had to take a Benadryl and she completely dropped, uh, she could not handle it. And it was her blood pressure dropped and uh, she had to take an EpiPen. She had to go to the ER and she was in the ER and we couldn't do anything here. It was like praying to Swami. And I think that was the best uh, reaffirmation I get from Swami today. I'm like, you know, as a mother, I was going through a little bit, you know, I was happy. Everything went well. She's well, she's back tonight with her school. Her teacher was there to kind of support her and be with her in the ER. And, and Samyukt was also not there in DC at the same time. He was away. So he was, she was all by herself. This was a big test for Sanskriti and she did well. But uh, for a thing to say that Swami comes like, you know, the bhakti is important, the devotion and the faith and the surrender, because that's the only thing I had. I didn't have anything else to do between me and Shiv. We didn't have anything to do other otherwise bhakti and surrender. And then Swami gives you the strength to go through that. And, and then he takes care of it. You know, it was like, I've been mentally processing, like, what is this? What is this? What is this? And now I do get the answer at the end of the session today. It's like, Thank you so much for being Swami's uh, you know, voice here and sharing with all of us. Thank you, Sairam. 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 You want to close the bhajan of me? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. sure. Yeah. Go. What pitch? Okay. Uh, you play harmony. You play harmony. Okay. Yeah. D. Govinda Krishna Vithala Venu Gopala Krishna Vithala Govinda Krishna Vithala Venu Gopala Krishna Vithala Govinda Krishna Vithala Venu Gopala Krishna Vithala Panduranga Vithala Jaya Pandhari Natha Vithala Jaya Pandhari Nath Vithala Krishna Vitala, Krishna Vitala, Krishna Vitala, Vitala,
विभूति परम विचिरा विभूति परमाष्णाश बाबा विभूति विदमाशयामी बाबा विभूति miraculous baba creation flowing from his blessed hands holy creation granting us the greatest wealth god's divine protection be love it baba grant us liberation be love it baba Grant us liberation. Om, om, om. ब्रह्म अहम वैश्वानो भूतान सुक्त पचाम्यम चुर्विधम ओ शांति शांति शांति